So, um, can I see a real quick show of hands? Who here is here for, kind of hearing for the Bitcoin for kind of close to the first time and wants to learn more about exactly what Bitcoin is and how it works? So, okay, I see a few hands and uh, hopefully the rest of you that aren't raising your hands, you'll learn maybe something a little bit new if you don't know about it already. So there's a couple of key characteristics in regards to Bitcoin that's really, really important to, to know. One of the most important characteristics is that there is a limited supply of Bitcoin. There can never, ever, ever be more than 21 million Bitcoins in the entire world. And that's totally different than the US dollar or Japanese yen or euros. At any point, governments can print more of their currency and it makes the currency that we have worth less. With Bitcoins, we can be guaranteed that that's not going to take place. Uh, Bitcoins, you can send these Bitcoins to and from anyone anywhere in the world instantly, basically for free. There are fees involved, but the fees are optional, and when you choose to pay the fee, generally they're less than a penny. So I think most of us in this room would consider a fee of less than a penny to be pretty close to free. Um, the Bitcoin network itself is peer-to-peer. So a peer-to-peer -peer network means that everyone's computer is just connected to everybody else's. Uh, there's, we can actually see a nice little uh, graph of that here. This globe here shows actually all the Bitcoin computers that are connected to the Bitcoin network around the world. So you can see we have, we have lots in Europe there, a lot more in China than just a few weeks ago. And of course, over in the United States, you can see lots of us here are interested in Bitcoin as well. Uh, so all these computers are just connected. This particular website we're viewing, we can see is connected to 1,173 other computers around the world. Uh, one of the amazing things about Bitcoin also is that it's impossible for anyone to block you from sending or receiving your payments with anyone else anywhere in the world. Uh, nobody even necessarily knows who's sending or receiving these payments. If we go back in here and look at the screen, we can see live Bitcoin transactions happening this is the US dollar amount, and that's the Bitcoin amount. We can see uh, apparently there's lots of bets being placed on one of the sponsors of the Wi-Fi here, Satoshi Dice, but these other ones that aren't labeled are unknown, and we don't know who's sending and receiving money with who. And you can see the US dollar equivalent, and if you want, you can see the equivalent in whatever your local currency as well on this website is. So it's really convenient to see what's going on, and we can see that there's a substantial amount of money that's being moved around the world in real time right here. And if we look just within, uh, the last six minutes, almost a million dollars worth of Bitcoins were sent. And before that, $1.6 million just 13 minutes ago, divided up into 311 separate transactions. Um, one of the most revolutionary aspects about Bitcoin is that for decades, people have been trying to figure out how to solve a problem of preventing people from spending the same money twice. And generally, the solution had been in the past would be they'd have one central ledger that would keep track of who owns what money. So if you bank at Bank of America or PayPal or with whatever credit card company, that company has a ledger of who has how much money in each account. And any time, you know, Alice pays Bob, they just update their ledger. The problem with that is that any time that company or some other entity can come along and say, we don't like who's paying who for what, and we want you to change that ledger, or undo this payment, or freeze this person's account, or, or do something else with that that maybe the actual owners of the people uh, with those accounts might not necessarily appreciate. With Bitcoin, there's no single ledger that's in one place. That ledger is distributed on all the computers around the world that are running the Bitcoin software. And that ledger is updated together in steps. And each time that ledger is updated, it's updated in a group of transactions that's called a block. And we can see the most recent block was discovered eight minutes ago and contained 210 transactions for $806,000 worth of Bitcoins. All these computers distributed all over the world have now updated their ledger. That ledger is not in one place, that's distributed all over the entire world. And the really, really exciting thing that that creates is that there's no central entity, there's no bank, there's no corporation, there's no government that can go to any one place and say, undo that ledger or change that entry or reverse that payment. There is nobody in the entire world that can block any of these payments that we see scrolling along here at the bottom. And you can see $38,000 just scrolled by there. People are using it to send large amounts of money all over the world. And there's nothing that anybody can do to stop or control that in any way. And this is the first time in the entire history of the world in which anybody on the planet with the internet can send or receive money with anyone else anywhere. And there's absolutely no way that anybody can interfere with that in any way. And I think that's really, really exciting. If you're in favor of people being able to control their own money, which I think the vast majority of people are, this is really, really, really exciting, world-changing thing stuff. 
Uh, with PayPal, they charge you 3% to send or receive money, and if you're doing it internationally, they'll charge you 4% plus currency, can, currency fees. With Bitcoin, you can do that in any country. It doesn't matter where you are, uh, and there's not anything anyone can do to stop it or control it in any way. Uh, when I first heard about Bitcoins a couple of years ago now, there were just a few Bitcoin exchanges, definitely less than 10. If we look today, we have a, a whole bunch of exchanges here. And you can see, so we have US dollar, US dollar, US dollar, Euros, Chinese RMB, Euros, British pounds, Australian dollars, and we can just scroll right on down the list and you can see we're probably getting up close to 100 different exchanges around the world. The biggest of which is Mt. Gox, and we can see that uh, in the last 30 days, they've transferred over 3 million Bitcoins worth just under 400 million U.S. dollars, and that's two dollars going in and out of the Bitcoin ecosystem. That's not counting any of the Bitcoins that were actually sent around in commerce. So it's really exciting to see that Bitcoin's really starting to pick up. Lots of real-world merchants are starting to use it. Uh, there's just all sorts of incredible things that are going on and a huge amount of innovation. Uh, People might think that uh, you're just some guy. How can I believe you that all this, these wonderful things about Bitcoin are true? Well, the neat part about Bitcoin is you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe anybody. If you have uh, the programming skills, you can actually read the Bitcoin code itself. The Bitcoin software, Bitcoin itself isn't a company. Bitcoin is just free software that anyone can download and start using on the internet. Anyone can build additional software that works around that. And the, vast, the Bitcoin core software itself is completely open source. That means anybody can read the software code. Anyone can see exactly how it works. And you don't have to trust anybody. You can see the code for yourself and be, that, that's the proof right there. You can read the code. You don't have to trust anyone. And everybody, millions of eyes around the world have looked at that at this point. It's been in operation about four and a half years now without really any major problems. And I think uh, the longer it goes, the less likely we are to see any sort of major problems. And uh, as we can see, I, lots and lots of people are using it all the time. Uh, Bitcoin mining causes a lot of confusion for people. Um, what I generally tell people is think of it like gold mining. Technically, you could go up in the mountains and dig around and get some gold, but your time is probably better spent doing other things and then just use the money that you earn from other things. For an actual description of what's going on with the Bitcoin mining, is all these computers around the world that we saw on our globe here. Assuming that they're running the Bitcoin mining software, and a good chunk of these I'm, I'm sure are, they are they're relaying all these transactions that are part of the Bitcoin network. And what happens is they need to update, sorry, too many tabs open already. Uh, they need to update this ledger. And what happens is they're trying to solve an incredibly difficult math problem. And when they find a solution, they're able to use that to encode all the most recent transactions into that next block, which is added to this ledger that's distributed on all these computers. So that's, there's other people here that can give an even more technical overview of it. The short answer is don't worry about it for the same reason you don't worry about gold mining. But that's what's going on with all the miners, is without the miners, the Bitcoin network wouldn't be secure. And all these transactions that we see here that are recorded into the Bitcoin blockchain, and you can see we're now on the 236,778th uh, block within that blockchain. And that's going to get longer and longer on into uh, infinity as people use Bitcoin. But without the Bitcoin miners, that wouldn't be secure and that wouldn't be happening. So that's, uh, that's important. Um, Commerce itself with Bitcoin is just exploding. Uh, one interesting example is uh, BitMit, which is basically, everyone here has probably heard of eBay. It's basically eBay, but for Bitcoins. And you can see people are selling all sorts of random things from all over the world to all over the world. And this is all being done in Bitcoin. So you can see there's just all sorts of stuff here from cigarettes to StarCraft games to computer parts and cash in the mail apparently as well. So. Um, it's really, really exciting to see all these various things that are happening. A lot of people always ask me, who sets the price for Bitcoin? Who's getting the money for Bitcoin? Bitcoin is set by supply and demand. On this page here, we can see the Bitcoin price over the last couple of days. This uh, yellow line on the left are people who want to buy Bitcoin. Down along the bottom, we have the various prices. The blue line are people who want to sell the Bitcoin. And where those two lines intersect is the price. So currently, the price is $122.65 on the largest exchange. In order for the price to get pushed down to $120, people would need to sell just under a million dollars worth of Bitcoins. You can see here, 7,875 Bitcoins 
worth 955,000 US dollars. To push the price up to, let's say, $130, people on this exchange would need to buy $2.3 million worth of Bitcoin. So this is constantly varying from day to day. You can see this green line is the recent price history. Uh, so that's what sets the Bitcoin price, is basically supply and demand. There's no one central place where people go to set that price. You can see all of these here are setting the price. And if there's a price discrepancy between one exchange to another, people will do arbitrage between those exchanges. So uh, even if one of these goes away, it won't really have any effect whatsoever because these are all over the world. There's another real interesting website called local, localbitcoins.com. And this is where anybody in any country in the world can enter their country and their zip code. And you can see here's a, I'm not sure what country I searched for most recently. Here we go, type in a place. So San Jose, California. And we can see a list of all sorts of people near here that are willing to buy or sell Bitcoins near San Jose. So, and there's lots and lots of people. So even if these other exchanges go offline, there's tons of people you can find here. There's feedback ratings. It works really similarly to eBay. Um, Another important thing to know, most of everybody here has used credit cards. When you buy something with a credit card or receive payment with a credit card, the credit card companies charge you two, three, sometimes even a eight or nine percent fee, depending on how risky they think your business is. With Bitcoins, you can send and receive money with anyone anywhere in the world essentially for free. If you decide that you still prefer dollars or euros or yen instead of Bitcoins, you can convert your Bitcoins back into whatever your local currency is for usually about a one percent fee, which is one-third the price that you'd be paying to the traditional credit card companies or PayPal. When you accept a payment with uh, credit cards, you also have the risk of credit card fraud or chargebacks. With Bitcoin, once you've been paid, that's it. There's no chargebacks, there's no risk of fraud. Uh, it's much, much safer in that sense than credit cards. Uh, one interesting use application that hadn't occurred to me until I heard of it. Uh, I was telling a, a friend of a friend who owns a consulting business in Tokyo about Bitcoins, and he was hearing about it for the first time. And uh, he, he got it. He understood no chargebacks. You can pay people anonymously as well. Uh, turns out he has a consulting business. Uh, his largest customer is Walt Disney. He wasn't quite as interested in Bitcoins for Walt Disney, but his second largest customer was the number one purveyor of adult goods in Tokyo which I thought was an interesting clientele base to have Walt Disney and adult goods being the two biggest customers for this consulting business. But uh, he realized that lots of uh, men in Japan and probably around the world sometimes like to buy dirty things on the internet. And uh, they pay with their credit card today for the most part. And uh, if the wife sees the credit card bill, she's probably going to be really unhappy when she sees that. And the husband's probably going to tell her, oh, honey, I would never buy something like that. So they call up the credit card company and issue a chargeback. So at that point, the husband's unhappy because he can't buy dirty things on the internet. The wife is unhappy because she thinks someone stole their credit card. And the site selling these sort of things is unhappy because they have a chargeback and lost a customer. And when this guy heard about Bitcoin, he realized this is perfect. Because in most countries around, this world, around the world today, you can now buy Bitcoins anonymously with cash at 7-Eleven, Walgreens, Walmart. Right now today in the US, you can buy Bitcoins at more than half a million locations anonymously by just depositing cash at your local 7-Eleven. Uh, and that's spreading to more and more countries around the world. So very soon, people who want to buy things on the internet that they might, want, they might not want their wife to know about can go and buy some Bitcoins anonymously with cash or even link it to their bank account because the wife wouldn't necessarily know what the Bitcoins were spent on. And then buy whatever sort of things on the internet and at that point, the company selling those things is happy, the husband is happy, and the wife is glad because their credit card is no longer getting stolen. So I think that's a real interesting use case. And uh, it's interesting because oftentimes that has been the predominant driver of the Internet. And then people use it for all sorts of under, other wonderful things as well. But uh, I suspect in Bitcoin we'll see that gaining steam as well. Uh, but another fantastic example, I think, and uh, full disclosure is that this is my own business, but uh, BitcoinStore.com is a website, and uh, I've partnered with the largest distributor of consumer electronics in the world. It's a company called Ingram Micro, and we have all more than half a million consumer electronics products. And I don't know, we can click on around here. There's all sorts of things, more stuff than I even know what to do with. So let's, uh, let's do a search for a SSD laptop, or SSD hard drive, apparently. So, and we're still working on the search, so. Um, anyhow, the vast majority of these 
are actually cheaper than Amazon. And the way we're able to do that is because we only accept Bitcoin as payment. So this is just some random flash drive here uh, that I have never searched for before. So let's take a look and see. On um, bitcoinstore.com, it's $5.18. Let's jump over to Amazon and see what that same part is. So $7.36. I don't know what the other buying choice is there. So $7.36 versus $5.18. Uh, the way we're able to do this is because with bitcoins, there's basically no fee. Uh, we don't have to deal with credit card fraud. We don't have to deal with credit card fees. And uh, the whole point of Bitcoin Store isn't really to sell things directly. It's to put pressure on existing merchants, though, to have to accept Bitcoin. So I think everybody today, that when you're buying things on the Internet, you would probably love to get a 1% or 2% discount. And I'm sure all these merchants on the Internet that are selling things and accepting PayPal or credit card, they're paying 2 or 3% to these companies. So I think at some point, these companies will start accepting Bitcoin, and they'll offer a discount to customers who pay in Bitcoin of 1% or 2%. So the company selling the goods will get a 1% or 2% discount, and the customer will get a 1% or 2% discount, and everybody will be really happy. And on an individual basis, it's not much money, but if you think about how many people all over the world are buying things on the Internet, this is going to save hundreds of millions of dollars a year, if not more, that's going to be able to be used for other things. And uh, it's so incredibly exciting. Lots of people that run online websites selling things, you can accept credit cards from certain countries. If someone wants to buy something from you from Indonesia with a credit card, you can't trust it. Almost for sure it's going to be credit card fraud. But with, uh, with Bitcoins, you can accept payment as a merchant from anybody in any country anywhere in the world. And I, I've dived a little bit too much into the business side. I'd like to back up to the Bitcoin tech, technical side. I kind of breezed over that a little bit. Do we have a couple of questions? Right, so what, uh, there's a number of different things that can take place there. So just about everybody in this room, I think, trusts Amazon.com to do the right thing. So when you're buying from Amazon.com, you can feel perfectly comfortable paying them in Bitcoins, knowing that if something goes wrong, Amazon would be willing to pay you back your Bitcoins. But if you're buying from some sort of website that you're not familiar with, that you're not so sure about, that might be an instance in which you would still want to use a credit card because of that chargeback protection you have. Or there's lots and lots of Bitcoin-related escrow sites that are coming online that people can use as well. And I'm sure we'll see lots of interesting things to address that exact problem. So I, I think you had your hand up next. A Bitcoin address that has, um, my name is Charles Evans, I'm based in South Florida. I run a website that is called coinregistrar.com. It's like a week old now. Um, and the point is that we will be the, th the third party to say, this guy identified himself to me, either a little bit or a lot. So if you just want to give me an email address and a Bitcoin address, or if you want to give me your photo and thumb, you know, it'll be up to you. But the point is that when this guy comes around asking a totally legitimate question, you point him to somebody that you're not affiliated with, and our hope is that we can bootstrap some sort of an ecology this way. I teach finance, by the way, and I see this as being a financial system more than anything else. Um, I'm sorry for grandstanding. Thank you very much. Please pass the mic to the next person. <clears throat> next person. The, the mic is on the way. Uh, actually, I'm boxed in. There you go. Uh, just a quick question. How, how do you deal with the scaling problem? I mean, right now it's, you know, it's pretty small numbers in the uh, scheme of a world economy. And if everyone's seeing everyone else's transaction, that isn't going to scale, right? You've got an N-squared problem. So um, actually, I was just talking with Gavin Anderson, who's the lead developer for Bitcoin, about this yesterday. And uh, I think he's probably one of the more knowledgeable persons to talk to about that. And his opinion is, one, currently it's not even close to being an issue. Uh, and actually, I should probably explain what, what this problem is, so for those of you that aren't already familiar. So the Bitcoin, this ledger that's distributed on all these computers across the world, um, that ledger takes up room on a hard drive. So this is the total size of that ledger since Bitcoin began. So we can see initially the ledger was basically zero megabytes. And then as Bitcoin became more and more popular, we can see that this is quickly growing. And currently, we're a little bit over 7 gigabytes. So seven point, almost 7.3 gigabytes today. As more and more people start using Bitcoin, this ledger that's held by all these computers around the world will become bigger and bigger. And today, just about every computer has enough room for 7 gigabytes. But what happens when this becomes 7 terabytes or 700 terabytes? And that will happen in the future. But uh, 
it, from the looks of it currently, we're far, far away from having to deal with any of that sort of issue. Um, and there will be ways to uh, deal with pruning the blockchain and having other ways that can actually help reduce that size. Or eventually we may have what's called a super node where everybody doesn't have a full copy of the blockchain. You'll just have a partial copy of that that you can use and then reference from some other server on the internet. So the short answer is that if that actually becomes a problem, that means Bitcoin is an incredible su success and we couldn't possibly hope to have a better problem than that. So, uh, but I think we're still at least a couple of years away from that actually becoming any sort of an issue. But if it does become an issue, that means it's because so many people are using Bitcoin and it's so incredibly popular that lots and lots of resources and time and effort and money will be addressed to solving that exact issue. So today it's not an issue. If it becomes an issue someday, it's a wonderful problem for us to be having. So. Sorry, one, one more quick question. Um, what about the issue of uh, taking 10 minutes or up to an hour, depending on how much verification you want for transactions? So again, that's basically not actually an issue. So we can look here and we can see these transactions scrolling here. In order for someone to tr attempt a double spend, it would cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars of processing power being contributed to do that. S sorry, I'm not talking about double spend. I'm just talking about uh, an initial verification. Sure. The initial verification actually just takes a couple of seconds. So for it to be recorded into the blockchain takes up on average about 10 minutes. But as soon as you see it, um, in fact, here we can show you right here. Here's a transaction that just happened one moment ago for almost $6,000 worth of Bitcoins. And on a site, they oftentimes will show you. Here's who relayed it. And I wasn't prepared right off. I'm sure there's somewhere that you can click and you can actually see how far this transaction has been propagated into the Bitcoin network, how many nodes have seen it. It'll tell you a likelihood of how likely it is to be included in the Bitcoin blockchain. And on just about every transaction, it's 99.999% that it's going to be included. In order for someone to try and cheat you, it would take tens and tens of thousands of dollars worth of processing power and a whole lot of luck in order for that to happen. So for even a transaction of this size, you don't really have to worry. As soon as you see it, that it's been distributed to the Bitcoin network, almost for sure you're, you're that it's just fine. And if someone's buying a cup of coffee from Starbucks, wouldn't even think twice about accepting it right away without it actually being recorded into the blockchain. So again, that's not really an issue. If you're selling a house to someone that you're really suspicious of for half a million dollars, Sure, wait a little bit to see that, that it gets recorded, but for any sort of reasonable size transaction, it's not even an issue. Any other questions or should I? Hi, uh, is it the case that Bitcoin store charges zero margin on their items? Yes, we're charging 0% markup on all our items. And uh, if we make money, we hope to do it by holding the Bitcoins and waiting. Oh, that, thank you for pointing out something I left out that's incredibly important. The supply of Bitcoins is limited, so there can't just be new ones that come into creation like it's happening with the dollar and the euro and the yen currently. Uh, and because the supply is limited, that means as more and more people use Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin in terms of dollars will have to increase. And we can actually uh, see that and I'll tell a little bit of the history behind it. So this is the price of Bitcoin. So this is the price of Bitcoin since uh, middle of 2010. Um, we can see in 2011, there was a little jump up in the course of a couple of weeks. It went from around $2 to almost $30. And what happened with that is uh, many of you here probably have heard of it. There's a website on the internet called the Silk Road that uses anonymizing software and Bitcoins because they can use, uh, be used anonymously to sell things that maybe certain people don't want other people to buy and sell and trade, uh, mainly illegal drugs. And the United States mass media printed all sorts of stories about how people can buy drugs on the internet with bitcoins. If you looked at that website on that particular, at that particular time, there were about 10 items for sale on there and it, they weren't particularly interesting. But of course people realized, oh my God, you can buy drugs on the internet with bitcoin? And people went crazy trying to get bitcoins as fast as they possibly could. And in the course of about two weeks, the price of bitcoin, and it doesn't look nearly as dramatic on this chart because uh, we're seeing what happened just a couple of weeks ago, but the price of Bitcoin went from about $2 to $30 in about two weeks. But at that time, there were no smartphone apps. There were no online wallets. There was no Bitcoin store. There were none of these gambling sites. There was almost no way that you could use your Bitcoins for anything at all. And even the website that was selling the illegal drugs didn't really have many illegal drugs at all. 
Um, but in the meantime, because of this huge amount of media attention that Bitcoin got, lots of really smart people and lots of people around the world heard about Bitcoin for the first time. And even though there weren't really many ways that people could use Bitcoin at that time, they realized this is going to change everything. This is an incredibly useful tool that people can use for payments all over the world. And all these people started working on software to make it easier for people to use. So in the last two and a half years since that happened, or two years about, now we have all sorts of Android apps, all sorts of iPhone apps, all sorts of shopping websites and gambling websites and all sorts of websites I'm sure I don't even know about yet. Uh, it's just incredible. And you know, here we are two years later, more than a thousand people from around the world have shown up to this conference in San Jose because they realized that Bitcoin is that interesting and that exciting. And that all kind of started because some other people made a website that didn't really sell much of anything, but the mass media picked it up and got real excited about that. And uh, I've rambled on about that a little bit. I forgot, what was your question about Bitcoin Star didn't have a markup? Yeah, 0% markup. Yeah. Isn't that um, anti-competitive towards other Bitcoin merchants? Um, I think it's a little bit extra competitive, so. Uh, That's not really a business if it's not making money. Well, actually, that, that brings me back to my point. So we can see again here recently, the Bitcoin price shot up from $30, briefly hit $266, and now it's dropped it back down to around $120. But that brings me back to my point that uh, because there's a limited supply of Bitcoin, as more and more people around the world start using Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin in terms of dollars will have to increase. Um, in fact, wouldn't I, it be cheaper then to just buy the bitcoins on the market and not run Bitcoin Store and lose all that money running the site? Well, I haven't lost money actually. We have it totally public on the website. You can see exactly how much we've sold. Um, my strategy with Bitcoin Store is every product that we sell, we keep the bitcoins. Um, so to date, so far, we just launched about a month and a half ago. We've sold four hundred thirty-four thousand dollars worth of merchandise, but collected six thousand two hundred thirty-eight bitcoins over that time. Uh, in the current month, we've sold 2,756 Bitcoins, and you can actually see, this is our Bitcoin address right here, and you can see exactly all the payments that are going in and out. So we've made that public uh, on purpose. But uh, our business strategy with Bitcoin Store is one, to put pressure on other merchants to accept Bitcoin, and two, we're just holding on to the Bitcoins because I'm a believer in Bitcoin, and I think as more people hear about Bitcoin and start to use it, the price of Bitcoin will increase, and that's where we'll actually earn our money. But it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, everybody gets to buy consumer electronics cheaper than they could otherwise, and uh, I get to hold on to the Bitcoin, so I'm happy for that too. Um, but uh, the, the key thing that I want to go back to is that as more people start using Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin will have to increase. Um, it's still incredibly, incredibly early. I wasn't planning to bring up my personal emails, but I can, uh, I have an email that a really, really smart person put together with some great calculations. So um, these are some numbers that somebody put together. So uh, in regarding to how do you value Bitcoin? Right now, Bitcoin's worth 120 something dollars. So Amazon grosses $38 billion per year, and pretty much all of that's done with credit cards. So if we assume that they're paying a 3% transaction fee, that means Amazon is paying $1 billion, with a B, dollars a year in credit card fees. So Amazon's net profit is about a billion dollars a year. So if Amazon could double their profits by doing all their transactions in Bitcoin, uh, so if the market cap for Bitcoin was $38 billion, that means, that means each single Bitcoin that currently is worth about 120 something dollars would be worth $5,400 each. So online gambling market, right? The online poker market is a $4.8 billion a year industry. Online gambling in, will follow poker, which is a $30 billion a year industry. So if the market cap for Bitcoin was $30 billion, each Bitcoin would be worth $4,300 each. Gas stations, that's another example. I'm sure just about every one of us here buys gasoline, and the vast majority of us probably pay for it with a credit card. Credit card companies are charging the gas stations a 2% transaction fee. By eliminating credit card transaction fees, gas station owners could double their profits. Hopefully they'd pass a little bit of it along to us, but we don't know for sure. Uh, U.S. companies consume 65 billion gallons of gasoline per year, and that's just the U.S. Remember, gas is used all over the world at $3.60 a gallon, so I think this is a little bit uh, old at this point. I believe it's a little bit more expensive currently in California. Uh, this could be a $234 billion going through the Bitcoin economy per year. So if the market cap for Bitcoin was $234 billion, 
Each single Bitcoin would be worth $34,000. Another fantastic use case for uh, Bitcoin is international remittance. I'm sure lots of people know people, if not yourself, that are sending money to other people around the world. Western Union charges huge fees. Banks charge $40 to send a wire transfer. You have to wait a couple of days and it's just a huge headache. With Bitcoin, you can send and receive money with anyone anywhere in the world instantly for basically no fee. So international remittance, uh, in 2007 worldwide, the people transferred more than $300 billion. Western Union fees can be between 4 and 20%. So if the market cap for Bitcoin was $300 billion, each Bitcoin would be worth 42,000 US dollars. And another thing to keep in mind in regards to all this is that it won't be only Amazon, it won't be only gambling websites, it won't be only gas stations. If any of one of these come on, it's going to be all of them coming on together. So it's going to be a, a combination of all these together. And the more people that are using Bitcoin, the more convenient Bitcoin becomes to use and the more additional people will want to use Bitcoin. So it kind of has a snowball effect in that sense. The more, the more people that are using it, the more useful it becomes, so the more other people will want to use it. So did I address your question adequately in some other topics as well? Any, any other uh, questions? My, microphone, please, so everyone can hear. Great. It's just a question on your, uh, it's not on the math exactly, but you say the market cap for Bitcoin is 234 billion. Each Bitcoin is worth such and such. And I agree with that part. But uh, why is it that if all the gas companies, uh, gasoline stations are using Bitcoin that, uh, to, to do their transactions, that that would cause the market cap to be $234 billion. It, it wouldn't necessarily be a one-to-one -one direct correlation, but that's assuming that most of these gas station owners would wind up keeping a portion of their savings in Bitcoin rather than dollars. So we don't know exactly what ratio that would be, but even if it's half that, you can still see that at 120 something dollars per Bitcoin, we're not even close to what Bitcoin will be valued at at some point if it becomes used okay. widely. Okay, okay great. How about, how about this young guy here, if we don't mind? Stand up. What's your, <coughs> what's your advice for kids spending Bitcoins? What, what's the best place for kids to spend Bitcoins? Is that your question? Oh, usefulness for kids. Yes. Okay. So uh, that's, uh, I'm glad you asked, actually. Uh, it's been a while since I was your age, but... Uh, as a young person wanting to buy or do things on the internet, or you can't. You can't get a credit card. Uh, can I ask your age, if you don't mind? Um, I'm nine years old. So at nine years old, I'm pretty sure you are not allowed to get a credit card. I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to open a bank account. And it makes it incredibly difficult to buy video games or World of Warcraft items or the things that you want to buy on the internet. With Bitcoin, there's no terms of service. Anyone can open an account. Anyone can download the software and start using it. And then you can buy, you like World of Warcraft or or a different game? Munchkin. Munchkin, okay, I'm not as familiar with that one, but I'm sure there's probably some in-game items that you would like to buy for Munchkin with Bitcoins. And with, with Bitcoins, anybody of any age in any country can do whatever they want with it. So this is absolutely fantastic for young people that aren't old enough to get credit cards or bank accounts. So, uh, and I imagine that your father's probably helped you already set up a, a Bitcoin account. Uh, well, it's just for my sister, him, and me, but it's mostly my dad's. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to have you as part of the Bitcoin community and tell all your friends about it as well. So. Hi, um, you spoke earlier about the 21 million um, Bitcoin cap. We seem to be on the verge of fractional reserve Bitcoin transactions now with Ripple coming online and whatnot, which runs, if I understand it, essentially on IOUs for, for Bitcoins. Um, are you aware of anybody that's doing any modeling in terms of what that might do to the total money supply, Bitcoin money supply? Yeah, I, I've been giving a fair amount of thought to that, actually. And uh, so basically what he's asking is what's stopping people from saying that they have Bitcoins on deposit and then issuing IOUs for those Bitcoins and then people trading those IOUs for the Bitcoins, which are different from actual Bitcoins. But then it has the net effect of people thinking that there are more Bitcoins in existence and being traded around than actually exist. And that's definitely an issue. Um, at some day, that, if that sort of thing starts happening, 
the musical chairs game that's going on may come to an end. So my advice for everybody that's using Bitcoins is hold your Bitcoins in your own wallet. Don't let someone else hold Bitcoins for you. Letting someone else hold on to your own Bitcoins is kind of asking for trouble. Uh, if you had a, a, a knapsack full of cash, you wouldn't just give it to some random stranger on the internet to hold for you. Keep it on your own device. Keep it on your own computer. Don't let other people hold your Bitcoins. But uh, computer security is very important as well. So if uh, Spend some time reading about that and reading about how to secure your Bitcoins safely. The other good news, though, is that there's lots of really, really smart software developers that are working on making it really easy to safely store your own Bitcoins. But no, that's definitely a concern. I don't have a simple, easy answer for you other than keep an eye on it and hold your own Bitcoins in your own wallet. Any other questions? Or I can go over some other things that I think are interesting. Hi. I was just wondering, you said that if the value of bitcoins keeps increasing and say it's like worth 20,000 US dollars, how would someone be able to buy, say, like a $100 laptop on the internet? How, I mean, how does it break up? Sure. So bitcoins currently are divided down to a one to 100 millionth of a bitcoin. So that's down to eight decimal points. So you can send a fraction of a penny anywhere in the world just like that. So that won't be a problem. Eventually, they'll start measuring bitcoins in maybe fractions of uh, micro bitcoins or milli bitcoins or the smallest unit currently that's 100 millionth of a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi. So maybe if Bitcoin becomes incredibly popular, people will start saying this, you know, coffee costs 32,000 Satoshis or something like that. So, but essentially, it's not an issue. Geeky technical question, but uh, on your Bitcoin store, do you run the actual wallet app on a server or are you running some kind of third party processing? Uh, we're using BitPay currently, and they handle all the back end, and they'll generate a unique Bitcoin address for each transaction. And uh, in the future, maybe people will do it themselves, but BitPay has already currently designed all the software and makes it really easy uh, to use. So I've, I've had a good experience with them, but I'm also an investor there, so take it for what it's worth. But. Hi, I have a quick question. Uh, my name is Ken from uh, CoinGig.com, uh, where we allow uh, sellers to come and open a store on our website and sell their products. Is that something you guys will allow in the future, or do you guys only sell your products? We're open to allowing that in the future. That would still be a couple of months away. There's still lots of additional work we want to do first. But okay. uh, anything that I can do to help promote Bitcoin and make Bitcoin easier to use, I'm definitely interested in. Oh, great. That's good to know. What's being done to make Bitcoin friendlier to normal people that don't understand? So um, actually, I just came across it last night. This looks pretty darn easy. So uh, let me remember the name of the app here. I just saw an app. Most of us have used text messaging before, I assume. There is a new app, and I haven't used it yet, but uh, it's called Glyph, and it's basically a text messaging app. Maybe people here have already used it before. I just downloaded it last night. They now allow you to link this with your Bitcoin wallet. And here they have it listed right on the front page. Bitcoin payments, hooking up your account to a Coinbase and begin spending and earning Bitcoin in your everyday life. So you can now send Bitcoins to and from anybody from your cell phone the same way you send a text message. And uh, they have a little video, maybe later take a look at it. But uh, I haven't used it firsthand. I just heard about it last night and I think they just announced it yesterday. But this looks like a really, really easy way to, to allow normal people that already know how to do chat on their phone to be able to send and receive payments via Bitcoin. Uh, so lots and lots of developers are working on making it easier for normal people to use Bitcoin. If you look at it today compared to two years ago, it's a million times easier. I understand it's still difficult, but I'm sure a year or two later from now, it'll be even easier than it is today. So lots of people are working on that exact issue. So. I, don't, I don't think that Bitcoin will take off until people can use it in daily life without having to really think through it. Do you know what I mean? I, I agree, actually, and that's why I'm really excited that all these software developers are working on making it easy and secure for normal people to use it in their daily lives. Can you maybe pass the microphone, please? Hi. I uh, recently convinced my law firm to start taking Bitcoin for uh, legal services. We've yet to have a customer yet, but I anticipate and hope that we will have one soon. Uh, what is your advice? How can we make it easiest for the customer and for us as a, as a merchant, as a provider? So, Arizona. We do have an IP practice as well. Okay. Uh, the first step, I think, would be to list on your website that you do accept Bitcoins as a payment so people actually know that you do. 
Uh, and then the second, it depends on if you want to keep the Bitcoins as dollars or keep them as Bitcoins. Yeah, I'm pretty sure my boss will want to put them in dollars right away. So if, if that's the case, there's, if he wants to put them in right away, uh, BitPay offers a fantastic service that actually, um, if I can remember... You can actually uh, go, they have a nice little video that'll demo it, but uh, anyhow, you can just go in and you, they have a little checkout plan. And if you haven't heard of BitPay, look into BitPay. It's incredibly useful. Basically, they'll generate a little online invoice for you. Um, in fact, it might be worth showing you guys. So. Now you guys can know what my security practices are. So this is a, a sushi restaurant in San Francisco that I just set up to accept Bitcoin a couple of days ago. Um, he's going to get a little order here that he doesn't know about. But uh, so basically, all you have to do is give anybody this link. This is the link link for his website, and he would save this, and he can save that on his phone or whatever he wants. So he'll enter in whatever order number he wants. So we'll make up an order number, and you put in the order total. So let's say that one dollar. You check, click the Bitcoin Checkout Now button. It automatically has generated a unique Bitcoin address. Here's the QR code that they can scan. And you can email this link to anybody, and they can just put in the amount that you owe. And you can see this is for Nara Sushi up in uh, San Francisco. And if I wanted to pay this, I can just scan that QR code with my phone. And I'll actually I'll show you guys what it looks like when the payment is made. So I'll scan that. So I've scanned it, now I have it on my phone. It automatically enters the right amount. Uh, I put in my password so that if someone steals my phone, they still can't steal my Bitcoins. Apparently I put in the password wrong. Now my phone is preparing to send the Bitcoins and we can watch, we have to send the payment within 14 minutes and 10 seconds here. And my phone has now sent the transaction. If we wait another couple of seconds, there it is. Order has been paid in full. So everybody can see. And then the way this owner, he's not really on board with Bitcoin yet. He's a friend of a friend and he agreed to accept Bitcoins. He just wants dollars. BitPay will automatically deposit $1 less a 1% fee, which is cheaper than credit cards, into his bank account the very next day. So something like this is incredibly convenient. And anybody that they want to receive a payment from, they just need to give them this link right here, and then they can enter whatever their order number is and the amount they want to pay. So a law firm would be something more like maybe $10,000 retainer bill. They would click checkout now, and it'll generate another invoice right here for $10,000 US dollars. It automatically calculates how many Bitcoins, so it would be 81 Bitcoins. I'm not going to pay this one for him, but, <laughs> but it works just like that. And the money, the dollars get deposited right into his bank account the very next day. Um, at the conversion rate, and it's actually really useful. They, they take the conversion rate from three different Bitcoin exchanges, and they uh, will give the, the, the customer the highest Bitcoin rate, so you know you're getting the very best value for your Bitcoin when you check out with them. And then uh, it's really convenient here. Hopefully I won't show anything that uh, is private, and I'll click away if I do, but so, yeah, we'll click away from that. Anyhow, on that screen, you can, uh, you can determine if you, when you receive a Bitcoin payment, you can split the payment. 99% dollars, 1% Bitcoin, 50, 50, 25, 75, whatever ratio you want, you can have, receive in Bitcoins and dollars. So if you're interested in Bitcoin, but you don't want to keep all of it in Bitcoin, receive half of it in, in US dollars and then keep the other half in Bitcoin and see what happens. So uh, I really, I'm an investor in BitPay, but I really, I invested because I really find their service incredibly useful and it makes it easy for normal businesses to use Bitcoin. Thank you. R right behind you. Uh, Next. Geographically, where do you find the uh, best place for banking outside of the U.S. in terms of the Bitcoin market? Where do I find the best place for banking? Well, obviously, there's risks with where you bank. I, I think the safest place at this point is in Bitcoin. And we've seen that just recently with what went on in Cyprus. Everybody thought their money in the bank was safe, and then they woke up one morning and boom, you know, a portion of it was gone. And then we saw the for same people thing. people that have to have some dollars, euros? Uh, if you have to have some, I, I don't really, 
I understand you have to have some. I suppose the country that you live in is the most convenient, um, not necessarily the safest or the smartest. Uh, in my day-to-day -day life, I do as much as I possibly can to use Bitcoins as often as I can. Anytime I buy anything from a merchant, I ask them, can you accept Bitcoin? Most of the time they say, what is that? And then I explain it to them. Maybe the first time they don't accept it, but if they hear from me and if I'm a repeat customer, after they hear from me a couple of times, a lot of them start accepting Bitcoin. Uh, and I think that's a good thing to do. And every time I spend Bitcoin, because I like Bitcoins more than dollars, I take my dollars and I buy more Bitcoins to replace them. So anytime I have the chance to use Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin instead of dollars. And I think that's a really good way to help get, grow the Bitcoin ecosystem. So I think she had her hand up next. Do you have anything else, sir? Oh, I could do a little rap. <laughs> you want? Hi, I just had a quick follow-up about how you described the merchant thing. So are you saying that the merchant never has to hold Bitcoins at all if they don't want to? Right. The they can let somebody pay them in Bitcoins, but what they accept is dollars. Right. So what, what BitPay does is exactly that. So it lets the merchant allow their customers to pay in Bitcoins, but the merchant themselves never has to deal with Bitcoins. All they see is a direct deposit into their bank account the very next day. So... And it's, it's really convenient. So, uh, and it's a great way for businesses that want to get additional customers, especially if you're dealing in online sales where credit card fraud is a, an issue. Bitcoins just blow away the competition. You can receive a payment from anyone with no risk of fraud, lower fees than credit cards, and the US dollars get deposited into your bank account the very next day. It's fantastic. Thank you for playing microphone delivery. <laughs> I'll just stay here. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I just have a quick question about what you think is the largest proponent to the kind of adoption that everybody always talks about. I find that whenever anybody starts talking about Bitcoin, it's usually to describe what it is to someone. And then when you finally finish that explanation, what you do is achieve in describing what everybody feels is that potential that's there for what Bitcoin can do at a, at a large scale, but there's this gap between that description and then that, that potential and reality. I always, this is probably a really bad example, but I always think of that South Park episode where there's the underpants gnomes and the first step is collect underpants and step two is, and then step three is profit somehow. So what do you think is in the most real terms what that mystery step is between where we are now in terms of physically actually getting to that level of adoption? Sure, I, I think the, the step from getting to where we are today to getting widespread adoption is just making it easier for normal people to use. So all these software developers out there need to make the software tools that make it easy for Bitcoin to use. And I think we, we're seeing that happen. I, I can think back when I first heard about Bitcoin, I literally there were no online wallets, there, were no, there wasn't even a single app in the iPhone app store or in the Android market for Bitcoins. Today, your eyes are going to start hurt if you start scrolling through all the different apps that they have for Bitcoin in the, in the app markets. And I think a year from now, there's going to be even more. So uh, that, that's what it'll take is people need to build the software that make it easy for normal people to use Bitcoins. And lots of people are working on that. And we're seeing that happen. Uh, one other interesting note, I suppose, is uh, that website that initially kind of kicked off the first Bitcoin bubble, if you can call it that, even though we're three times higher than what that or four times higher than what it was initially. Um, the website that was selling the illegal drugs, if you looked at it at that time, there were around 10 items for sale on there. If you look at that same website today, there's more than 10,000 items for sale on there. So it definitely shows that people are using Bitcoin. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other people that are using it for so many other wonderful things as well. So any other uh, questions in particular? I think what, if people want to ask questions, maybe we can have them start lining up here in the middle where the microphone is on the stand. Um, I was just curious if you have any long-term concerns of Bitcoin being used in business. If a lot of businesses start using it, could there be some kind of windfall where, you know, the system falls apart and it could be catastrophic? Just curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, there is a risk of that, but as each day goes by and there hasn't been a major catastrophe, the odds of someone finding some sort of exploit or problem with the Bitcoin protocol are lower and lower. Um, with the U.S. dollar, there's lots of bank robberies, but that's not a problem with the U.S. dollar. That's a problem with the bank's own security. With Bitcoin, we've seen lots and lots of Bitcoin hackings and thefts, but that's a problem with these websites that are using Bitcoin and their security practices. It's not an actual problem with Bitcoin itself. Um, so I think at this point, it's 
pretty darn, you can feel pretty darn secure in the Bitcoin protocol itself. Uh, but don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Don't keep all your money in Bitcoin. Uh, and don't keep all your Bitcoins in one wallet. Uh, just spread them around a little bit. Uh, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. Bitcoin is money. It, it pays to be careful with your money. Uh, but I don't think we have to really worry at this point about a major catastrophe ex damaging the core Bitcoin protocol itself. I think, you know, we're four and a half years in now and still going strong. I think you can feel pretty confident in regards to that. So, Thank you. Um, just to point something out, again, I mentioned earlier, I teach finance, so I think about this from the money side of things, is ranking the most likely uses for Bitcoin as well. So right now, um, buy and hold, and I suppose there's some day trading going on. Uh, originally it was mining. Um, of course now, as somebody who teaches business, I wonder if the mining business were so great, then why are these people willing to part with their machines? But that's just me. Um, <clears throat> but I live in South Florida. And I find that many of my students now want to get together and start setting up remittance networks back to their hometowns in Latin America and the Caribbean. And if there's anybody from Latin America and the Caribbean in here, I'd like to talk with you. So retail will come in when you reach some sort of critical mass. But uh, I would say just keep your eyes open, use your artist's ear, and just look for what the most likely use of the money is at this particular point. And paying the rent is probably not it quite yet. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You're in San Francisco, whatever. Anyway, thank you very much. Which, which country? Can you name them? Uh, my, my students uh, tend to cluster uh, in Ecuador. Um, I have a bunch from Peru. I've got some Jamaicans. And uh, we also have some Argentines who are looking at ways of uh, routing around the encryption with regards to the currency controls in Argentina. Uh, we're very actively looking at that. Um, I need to talk with the U.S. attorney to find out if I'm exposing myself to anything by doing that, but I suspect not, but I probably won't be visiting BA anytime soon. So when, when you mentioned about paying your rent with Bitcoin, one interesting website is NineFlats.com. It's basically a competitor there to Airbnb that has about a third as many listings, so they have over 100,000 listings. And you can see these are all places in Florida that you can rent with Bitcoin. I stand corrected. So, and there, you know, the page goes on and on. In Florida, Look 380 you. places for rent with Bitcoin right now. Look so, um, That's it, fantastic. It's starting. And then the owners of all these places, they can choose when they want to be paid out for their rent. They can choose to be paid in Bitcoin or other one, one thing that's missing, we have a neighborhood in North Miami. It's a, an industrial district that's being gentrified by young men with bad, well, actually, our guys have good haircuts uh, and good ideas. But um, one thing that is missing that we're still working on is getting retail shops, especially where the hipsters hang out, because there's a coffee shop that I was there, and I, surely these people know it. It was like, what's that? Uh, that's the one major thing that's lacking where we are, is just getting the people on the street to accept it. And that's one of the things that my students and I are working on. That's, that's one major thing, but that's also one of the most exciting things about Bitcoin. And pretty much everybody in this room realizes just how world-changing and important Bitcoin is. But you guys have to keep in mind, Bitcoin is worldwide. And the vast majority of people haven't even heard of Bitcoin yet. And if Bitcoin already has this many people this excited about it, wait until the rest of the world actually hears about it. I mean, this is so exciting. You guys are right on the cutting edge. Most people haven't even heard of it. But that's our job is to let these other people know about it. Let them know about the characteristics of Bitcoin. Let them know about the ways they can use Bitcoin. Let them know how it can make their life better and easier. And uh, the world is just going to love it. I mean, nothing like this has ever existed before. And we need to go out and spread the word and let people know about that Bitcoin is here. You can use it now. There's software. And it doesn't matter what country you're in. What, it doesn't matter anything about who you are. It doesn't matter your age. You can do whatever you want with Bitcoin. And there's not anything anyone can do to stop it. And it's really, really exciting. And uh, go out and tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody about Bitcoin. Uh, this is just getting started. And that's what's so exciting about it is that most people haven't even heard of it yet. So, any other questions here? Or? Right here. It seems uh, a, a lot of thought has gone into the idea that, that government might be afraid of Bitcoin or not want Bitcoin and uh, attack it in some way. Uh, I, I'd like to flip that around and get your ideas. It, it seems to me that maybe a smart government might say, if you can't beat them, join them, and maybe try to take over the mining aspect or 
uh, jump in, buy a bunch of Bitcoin, hold them in reserve for their own currency, something like that, but sort of help sponsor Bitcoin in some way. And now I was wondering if you have an idea about that, if there's any evidence that that might be happening already. Um, those are a number of different ideas you touched on there. One thing that was just announced, I think, yesterday or the day before, is that uh, there's going to be a free zone in a particular Latin American country, and the official currency of that zone is going to be a, a crypto coin. We don't know for sure if it'll be Bitcoin or some other competitor, but that's uh, interesting. If you're scared or worried or wondering if Bitco uh, a government might buy up a whole bunch of Bitcoins to hold as reserve currency, my uh, investment advice to you is buy a bunch of Bitcoins before that government does, because that would certainly drive the price up a bit. Um, and was there a third point as well, or? Well, just look for evidence whether you're seeing some oh. activity that way. I, I hear whispers of certain things. Um, maybe about a week ago now in China, the, the Chinese state TV channel, CCTV, had a half hour long special on Bitcoin that was almost entirely positive. And uh, that TV show wouldn't have been produced and made it to the air if the Chinese government hadn't given it at least tacit approval. And uh, because of that show, for at least a couple of days there, I haven't checked since then, the number of people downloading the main Bitcoin software, there were four times more Chinese downloading it each day than Americans. So it's really exciting to see Bitcoin starting to spread to other countries around the world. And that's another important thing to remember. It's true, maybe, so hopefully governments will embrace Bitcoin and like it and see all the benefits that it'll bring the world. Some governments might not like Bitcoin, but that's the exciting thing is that Bitcoin is worldwide. So even if one particular government decides they don't like Bitcoin and they want to stop it, it doesn't matter because it doesn't mean it'll be illegal in you know other countries around the world. So, um, bit, uh, his question is, what is my opinion on other cryptocurrencies? Bitcoin definitely has the 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 widest uh, market share at this point. Um, other cryptocurrencies have other interesting properties, but it would take something that's going to be a lot better than Bitcoin to displace it. Oftentimes, it's better to just be first than to necessarily be best. Uh, but Bitcoin definitely has the lead at this point. Um, but I know there's going to be a whole, there's a whole talk on different alternate cryptocurrencies as well. And if you're interested in that, I think you can learn more there. But uh, currently, I'm most interested in Bitcoin because the other currencies don't have anywhere near the market share of Bitcoin at this point. But uh, from my point of view, I'm excited about Bitcoin, not because of Bitcoin itself, but because of the properties that it has and how it allows more people around the world to have more control over their own money. So if something even better than Bitcoin comes along that has even better properties and gives people even more control over their own financial lives, I'll be totally in favor of that. And you'll see me here next year preaching about that, uh, that new cryptocurrency. But it doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or Litecoin or Freightcoin or Ripple or any of these other ones. Uh, it's the idea and the freedom that it brings to people that I'm excited about. And I think that's why a good chunk of the people are at this conference today. So that, that's my thoughts. So uh, I think one last question, I think that's time for us, but. Okay, um, I, I'm curious. I mean, you know, we've had digital currency attempts before like flus, I think 10 years ago. Uh, could you just kind of sketch out what are the differences between a Bitcoin and a flus uh, type currency. Sure, that's a really important point to, to cover and a lot of people have a uh, misunderstanding about Bitcoin. They think, why is Bitcoin different than Flues or Beans or PayPal or whatever I've used all before? Bitcoin is fundamentally different. With Flues and Beans and PayPal, there's a central ledger that that company can update or change or modify in any way at any time. With Bitcoin, there's this distributed ledger that's distributed all over the world that nobody can modify or update. So with, with flus, if they didn't like what you were doing, they can update their ledger and say, boom, you no longer have any flus in your account and you can't send and receive payment with anybody. With Bitcoin, the only way to stop Bitcoin or control it would be to shut down every single computer in the entire world that's running the Bitcoin software. And you can see on this globe, and they're everywhere. And every, every time I look at this globe, I see more and more of these dots. So the higher the, the bar you see, that means the more computers in that location running the Bitcoin software. So. Uh, it's fundamentally different than any other payment system that's ever existed in the entire history of the world before. And that's why Bitcoin is so exciting. It's because no single person, no single government, no single corporation can control it in any way. And the cat's out of the bag at this point. It's unstoppable. It's just a question of how soon we're going to see widespread adoption. It's not a question of if. So thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.